So welcome everyone, uh, welcome to Georgetown. It's my pleasure this evening to introduce Nathan Satino, who is an associate professor of history at Rice University in Houston, Texas, uh, specializing in uh, the history of the United States and the world and in the history of the Middle East. His first book, From Arab Nationalism to OPEC, Eisenhower, King Saud, and the Making of U.S.-Saudi Relations, was published by Indiana University Press in 2002. His most recent book, on which he's going to be speaking, um, Envisioning the Arab Future, Modernization in U.S.-Arab Relations, 1945 to 1967, was just published a few months ago by Cambridge University Press and has already received rave reviews. Um, many of us who have read it are very excited to hear more about this. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce Nathan Satino to you. My apologies, I forgot to introduce myself. My name is uh, Corrine Walther. I'm a professor of history here at Georgetown. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, thank you to uh, Dr. Corrine Walther for organizing this talk. Uh, this is my first time in Doha, uh, and I've, I've really enjoyed uh, everyone I've uh, met and, and spoken with. I've been especially uh, looking forward to this evening. Tonight, I'll be talking, uh, as you heard, about my new book. Uh, which is called Envisioning the Arab Future, Modernization in U.S.-Arab Relations, 1945 to 1967. And my research examines an earlier time in U.S.-Arab relations when that relationship was very different. The Middle East uh, looked very different than it does today. And so I'm often asked, uh, how does studying the past uh, help us today? Or what, what can we take from the study of the past? And I think certainly, uh, um, Studying the past doesn't offer any clear solutions or prescriptions, uh, but if I can help uh, people to see contemporary issues in new ways, perhaps with uh, greater context, depth of understanding, then uh, I think I, I will have made uh, some contribution uh, to uh, our discussion of, of uh, U.S.-Arab relations, uh, the role of the United States in the world, uh, the past, present, and future of this region. Uh, so let me uh, cut right to the chase here and tell you what the main argument of this book is. Um, of course, I'm hoping that at least some people maybe will acquire the book, but uh, after hearing tonight's talk, you won't have to read it. Um, I'll, I'll kind of give you the Cliff's Notes version. The main argument is that rather than being fundamentally divided by culture, Americans and Arabs contended over the meanings of modernization within a shared set of Cold War era ideas about development. So uh, my book is part of a larger uh, sort of project or attempt by historians to understand modernization and development in historical terms. One of our colleagues uh, has written that the, the aim of this uh, sort of approach is to put the framework in the frame. In other words, to think about modernization, to think about development as concepts um, that are really artifacts of a particular time in recent history, in the middle 20th century, uh, in the years of the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union, uh, in the moment of decolonization uh, and the creation of new sovereign states in the Arab Middle East, in other parts of uh, what had been the colonized world. So that's what uh, I'm doing in this book. That's what I'm contributing to in, in my research. So the contest to shape the future that my book is, uh, is uh, essentially uh, about included secular Arab nationalists, it included Arab Islamists, and it included Arab communists, as well as uh, the United States. So it's a, a context that's characterized by ideological pluralism. It took place uh, in a global setting, uh, as I said, dominated by the superpower rivalry and the struggle for development among the uh, newly emerging and independent states of the so-called third world. Despite sharp differences uh, over um, economic policy, over anti-communism, over Zionism and Israel, 
intellectuals and officials from the U.S. and from Arab countries spoke a common language of modernization. The book's basic idea, then, is to examine how Americans and Arabs waged political conflicts within the bounds of shared concepts during a particularly uh, important period in recent history, uh, the 25 years or so after World War II. This emphasis on uh, secular modernization and development is important uh, as a, a kind of uh, context from the recent past, given the focus today on sectarian religious struggle and assumptions that religious difference has always been at the center of regional conflict. So the book examines uh, modernization in U.S.-Arab relations through several case studies. And tonight I want to focus on two of those cases. The first uh, looks at global Arab travel during the Cold War. Uh, Arab travelers, Arab travel literature written in Arabic uh, by uh, figures who traveled to the United States, to the Soviet Union, to uh, areas of the, uh, the Soviet Eastern Bloc, to other developing parts uh, of the world. The second case study examines U.S. policy toward revolutionary Iraq. So looks at the, the, some of the earliest policies of the United States toward Iraq uh, in the years after uh, the uh, revolution in Iraq in 1958. Okay, so those are our two uh, case studies today. Let me say uh, just a few words to set the stage and talk more about this context, uh, the setting uh, in uh, the post-World War II period uh, where my uh, book is, is set and, and focuses. These post-war years were a time both of loss and of hope. The loss of Palestine and the creation of the refugee crisis when some 750,000 Palestinians fled or were driven from their homes by Zionist forces in 1948 during the creation of Israel. The Arab-Israeli conflict would destabilize Arab governments and pose an ongoing obstacle to regional development and stability. But there were also rising expectations in the re region and reasons for hope European empires were retreating, creating newly independent post-colonial countries in the Middle East and in other parts of the world. A new generation of leaders was coming to power and promising rising living standards in terms of land, education, jobs. These were years of intense state economic planning in areas such as land reform, desert reclamation and irrigation, heavy industry, money and banking, schools, roads, family planning, and so on. New leaders were often military officers who led revolutions against uh, elites who had been tied to the colonial powers. So we're talking about new leaders uh, such as, and, and uh, princip most principally, most importantly, Gamal Abdel Nasser in Egypt, uh, and also Abdel Karim Qasim in Iraq. Arab governments uh, sought development assistance both from the United States and from the Soviet Union. And the superpowers were often willing to provide that aid, that assistance, because they were engaged in a Cold War competition uh, for influence in the Third World. The recently formed United Nations organization focused attention on economic development and specialized UN agencies and private philanthropies, such as the Ford Foundation and the Rockefeller Foundation, provided aid and expertise to newly independent countries. Okay, so that's sort of setting the stage. Um, I then wanted to tell you about uh, a particular figure, a particular uh, uh, Arab leader, uh, someone from Syria, uh, such a, a, a kind of troubled uh, part of the region uh, today, uh, but as a way of uh, giving you a sense of, of uh, the kind of ideological pluralism and, and debates about the, the future of the Arab Middle East. And that individual uh, is the uh, prime minister, then foreign minister of Syria, uh, whose name was Khaled al-Azam. Uh, in 1955, uh, Khaled al-Azam came to the United States to attend the 10th anniversary celebrations uh, in San Francisco of the founding of the United Nations, so the 10-year anniversary of the founding of the UN. As part of that trip, he visited some of America's leading tourist sites, uh, 
Uh, he visited New York City, uh, where he rode to the top of the Empire State Building, and he observed how, uh, in his words, uh, Broadway staggered across Manhattan's grid like a drunk. He visited Chicago. He visited Los Angeles, where he saw the movie star's uh, hand in the footprints uh, pressed into the cement outside of Grauman's Chinese Theater in Hollywood. He marveled at the Golden Gate and Bay Bridges in the San Francisco uh, Bay uh, area, and he made numerous observations about American society. From the energy of America's cities to the quality of its music and food, of which he did not think very highly, and even the, the high price of uh, medicine. He was a diabetic and, and insulin. He found very expensive in the United States. Of everything he saw and experienced in the US, however, what most impressed him was the speed of his flight from LA to Washington DC across North America. Uh, in his memoir, he, he bragged that he, uh, in this flight reached uh, 650 kilometers per hour, which he pointed out matched the airspeed record for 1955. He was very impressed by this, uh, achieving uh, this speed record. Nevertheless, at the UN uh, festivities in, in San Francisco, uh, he felt that he was snubbed by the US President Dwight P. Eisenhower. Um, and so uh, Khaled Azm used the occasion to establish a relationship with the Soviet foreign minister whose name was Vyacheslav Molotov. In fact, the, the two of them sort of talking together on the sidelines of the UN anniversary was snapped in a, a picture by a photographer from Life magazine. Two years after coming to the US, so in 1957, Khaled Azm visited the Soviet Union. He flew to Moscow on what he called the greatest jet airplane in the world, which soared at 580 kilometers per hour at a height of 10,500 meters. In the Soviet Union, he visited hydroelectric dams, factories, and villages on a trip that took him from Moscow to Tashkent, Stalingrad, Kiev, Leningrad, and Sochi on the Black Sea. His Soviet hosts uh, let him borrow an Ilyushin airplane, an aircraft, to cover these great distances, but he also traveled by car, by ship, and by train. At the Hermitage Museum, Al Azam was so exhausted touring room after room of great works of art that he even had to request a wheelchair and traveled for a little while in a wheelchair. At the end of his long trip, he signed an agreement by which the Soviet government promised to provide Syria with economic and development assistance. So he, in effect, entered the, the Soviet camp, at least for, that, uh, for the purposes of, of economic development. So the story about Khaled al-Azam is representative of my work in several ways. First, instead of beginning with the US and describing uh, Americans as exporting modernization to the Middle East, um, I approach these issues from the perspective of, of regional history, of Middle Eastern history, using uh, Arabic sources. Khaled al Azam belonged to an old and very privileged Damascus family that had filled high government uh, offices in the Ottoman Empire going back to the 18th century, uh, when the Ottomans had introduced some of the first modern reform movements in the Middle East. He himself had been born into an Ottoman world which came to an end following World War I. He had lived to see the creation of an independent Syrian state controlled by French colonialism under the League of Nations mandate system, but then witnessed Syrian independence following another world war. During the uh, Syrian revolution of March 1963, uh, when the Ba'ath, an Arab nationalist and socialist party, seized power in Damascus, al Azam was forced to flee Syria and even sought help from John Kennedy's State Department to uh, escape Syria. So al Azam himself embodies 20th century Middle Eastern history, um, and he wrote one of the most important uh, political memoirs in Arabic of the 20th century. And there's a huge memoir literature in Arabic, uh, especially after 1945, and some of those memoirs uh, form the uh, sources for, uh, for my study. A second reason why his story is important is that uh, 
an account of his life shows how he moved through a world of competing ideologies, of ideological pluralism that included not only American capitalism and Soviet communism, but also pan-Arab nationalism, represented by the towering figure of Abdel Nasser. Al-Azam came to bitterly criticize Nasser's rule over the United Arab Republic, the UAR, the temporary union between Syria and Egypt between 1958 and 1961. But al-Azam's world uh, also included Islamism, whose proponents after World War II presented Islam as an economic development strategy that was an equivalent but superior path to either of the superpowers prescriptions uh, and to secular pan-Arabism as well. Most importantly, uh, for my purposes, and this is why I emphasized it in my account of, of his uh, sort of career and travels, Khaled al-Azam illustrates how speed affected the politics of development and modernization in the middle of the 20th century. And this is one thing I'm really interested in because it crops up again and again in those uh, Arabic language memoirs I mentioned. The ability to cover great distances in a very short period of time affects uh, the, the perceptions and politics of development, uh, certainly in the, in the Arab world and in other uh, parts of the world. Um, as well. Jet age speed granted Arab and other world travelers compressed experiences of other societies. I'm on a four day, three day tour of Qatar, so I kind of relate to this idea of a kind of compressed and uh, sped up experience of, of uh, another, uh, another country. Right? Travelers could then uh, compare uh, those different societies as alternative development models. And this is what they did on the page uh, in, the write in the, the, their travel uh, literature, their memoirs, their political writings after they returned uh, from, uh, from, their, uh, from their travels. Uh, so, um, for instance, uh, in 1955, before he came to the U.S. for the U.N. celebration, Al-Azam had attended the Conference of Afro-Asian uh, Nations at Bandung, Indonesia, where he met uh, other post-colonial leaders. On the way there, he spent time in Calcutta, and he returned through Bangkok. He wrote uh, as vivid descriptions of those cities as he did of New York. These experiences gave him a sense that Arab states shared similar challenges uh, to those of other third world societies outside the Middle East. Al-Azam could also use his first-hand experiences of the U.S., uh, of the Soviet Union, to assess the superpowers' claims uh, about whose system represented a better path to development. Now, global travel, uh, of course, was nothing new for Arabs of means, going back to the time of Ibn Battuta, during the 19th century, uh, in what some historians call the age of steam and print, steamships and trains had enabled uh, travelers from Egypt, from the Ottoman Empire, to visit Europe, Japan, the US, and elsewhere, and then spread the news uh, about new uh, technologies and ideas. But the jet plane and other 20th century modes of travel enabled a larger cross-section of Arab society than ever before, and not just those from privileged families like Al-Azams, to encounter a range of different societies more rapidly than ever before. Many of these travelers came from more modest class uh, origins than Al-Azam had because revolutionary changes in the Arab world and the Cold War gave opportunities for traveling the world to military officers, to college professors, to doctors, to students, uh, to uh, party members, and many other ordinary people. These globe-trotting uh, Arab travelers also came from across a political spectrum, uh, uh, an ideological political spectrum. They included, for instance, uh, the famous Egyptian Islamist Said Qutb, who came to the US between 1948 and 1950 and used his experiences there in arguing for an Islamist uh, path to modernity. Qutb famously criticized American society uh, for its immorality after attending a, a, a church social in Greeley, Colorado, where teenagers danced uh, together to the tune, Baby, It's Cold Outside. 
I used to live very close to Greeley, Colorado. I taught in Fort Collins, Colorado for 15 years at Colorado State uh, University, and I would tell my students the story about Cyclitub and going to Greeley, and they would scratch their heads because Greeley is not Las Vegas. It's not this sort of den of sin and, and you know, bad behavior. It's this very sort of in a sober and very conservative uh, frontier town uh, on the plains of eastern Colorado, but, uh, but no matter. In addition to Islamists, uh, travelers also included Arab communists, uh, and there's a small but very uh, important uh, cohort of, of uh, communists from different Arab countries in the middle decades of the 20th century who visited the Soviet Union, China, Cuba, uh, countries of the Eastern Bloc. So all of these travel experiences contributed to a lively and wide-ranging debate in the Arab world about what the future should look like, debates in which the rapid-fire comparisons of different societies imitated the touching down and uh, lifting off from different points across the globe made possible by modern travel. So speed, I argue, affected the language of political debates about modernization and development, um, an important part of my work uh, is examining these debates in English uh, and in Arabic. So at the beginning I said that after World War II, uh, Americans and Arabs spoke a common or shared language of modernization. And I'll give you um, two examples of what I mean by that, of this common language. One involves the word system. Uh, a very you know, sort of Cold War era world, uh, which in, uh, uh, in Arabic is al-Nizam, right, al-Nizam. This word was applied to modernizing ideologies as in the competing American and Soviet systems, right? and even as a way of understanding uh, modernity itself. Uh, Daniel Lerner, who uh, many of you may have heard of, who was a famous social scientist who wrote a book in the 1950s called The Passing of Traditional Society, uh, in that book, Lerner wrote, the conditions which define modernity form an interlocking system. Arab intellectuals, uh, and even those from completely different political orientations, also use the term system to refer to their preferred ideologies. This was true of Khaled Bakdash, who was an ethnic Kurd who led the Communist Party of Syria and Lebanon. It was also true of Qutb who described Islam as an economic and social system that was superior to both the superpowers ideologies. So the use of this term, system, al-Nizam, in this way not only shows that Arabs participated in Cold War debates about modernization uh, and used its uh, terminology for regional politics, it also points to a shared understanding of society itself as a system made up of interlocking parts and of modernization as consisting of interdependent social, economic, political, and cultural changes. This is part of the, um, the uh, idea that modernization and the, the idea of development is a, an artifact of the middle 20th century, that its meaning is not uh, sort of, of uh, uh, eternal or general uh, or um, static but that it belongs to a, a particular context, a particular time, uh, and particular places. A more interesting uh, example of this shared language, I think, is the way that Americans and Arabs similarly used speed metaphors to represent modernization. In other words, they represented society's development over time as acceleration through space. The most famous use of speed to represent modernization, certainly for Americans, came from the US economist and presidential advisor, Walt Whitman Rostow, one of the architects of America's war in Vietnam. Rostow compared developing countries' achievement of self-sustaining economic growth to the takeoff of a jet airplane. And he talked about economic takeoff when a developing country uh, achieves self-sustaining uh, economic growth. Partly because of this vivid metaphor, con comparing a developing country's uh, economy to the uh, building up of speed and then eventually taking off and, and lifting off the ground. Rostow helped to popularize modernization as an anti-communist foreign policy doctrine 
toward developing countries during the Cold War period. So uh, historians, uh, uh, our colleagues, have written about Rostow's influence on US policies in Latin America and certainly in Vietnam. But my argument is that Arabic writings from the same period use similar metaphors of speed and motion to represent modernization. So I'll show you a couple of uh, visual examples of this. Here are two political cartoons. Uh, and the cartoon on the left is from the famous Egyptian uh, magazine, Ruza Yusuf, which, uh, and this cover, this is the cover that was published in 1944. It helps to illustrate the political meanings of speed. It depicts uh, the Egyptian everyman. You can see him there on the back of a, a mule. Uh, this little, little fellow's name is Misr Effendi. He has kind of big, thick glasses like I do. Um, and as you can see, he's looking a little nervous. Uh, he's kind of uh, looking over his shoulder at this locomotive racing by at, at under full steam. And it looks like he's trying to uh, catch up on his little mule who's uh, worn out. Um, and as many of you can, can see, uh, the, the locomotive uh, is labeled the world after the war. The world after the war. And uh, Mr. Effendi has his own little sign and it says Egypt after the war. And at the bottom, there's a kind of ironic caption that says the age of speed, right? The age of speed. Uh, so it, it uh, depicts uh, anxiety about Egypt's development vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world uh, in a way that uses speed in a metaphorical way. Egypt, uh, if you can imagine this uh, being a kind of film that's going to play out, is going to fall farther and farther and farther behind. Right? That's, the, that's the worry, that's the concern, uh, that's the anxiety. Very similar image on the right. This comes uh, from an Iraqi magazine called Karandel, and it shows, and the, there's a caption here that you can read uh, um, in English, uh, but the, um, the locomotive here that's racing at, at full steam over this bridge has a face. Does this face remind you of anybody? So it's supposed to look like Joseph Stalin, right? So this is communism, and the locomotive is labeled communism, right? And it's, it's crossing over a bridge that's held up by, by figures labeled feudalism, poverty, uh, sickness, all these kind of social ills. And the argument is that uh, communism advances in a, a spatial way in a context in which there, uh, there's human suffering, right? So this is, uh, this is a similar kind of uh, image. So here are, here are two visual images uh, or examples of this metaphorical use of speed. Let me give you a couple of textual examples as, as well. One of the leaders, uh, indeed one of the founders of the Syrian Ba'ath Party, whose name was Zaki Arsuzi, uh, described industrialization as transforming the people from a condition of dependency to a condition of mastery, or as he wrote, the mastery of the driver over the machine by which the car reaches its destination and the nation takes its place among industrialized countries. In another example, this is one of my favorite examples of a use of a speed metaphor in, in text, uh, one of Abdel Nasser's uh, free officer colleagues, an officer who uh, administered one of Egypt's most important agricultural projects in the 1950s, described development in this way. All of us, he wrote, in our country are riding horses, galloping to catch up with the procession of the age and civilization. If we know the language of the age and its spirit, means, and laws, then we can exchange this horse for cars or airplanes. Okay? In fact, Nasser's uh, labor and industrialization policies in the mid-1960s under Arab socialism in Egypt in the mid-1960s, explicitly borrowed Walt Rostow's language of takeoff and the concept that all countries passed through the same stages of development. So Egypt's economic development plan in the middle 1960s explicitly borrowed uh, this language. But such metaphors weren't used only by secular nationalists. The Shia Iraqi cleric, Mohammed Bakir al-Sadr, helped found uh, Iraq's uh, Dawa party uh, to win uh, Shia away from the Communist Party in Iraq. And al-Sadr described Islam as a system 
for national economic development and human happiness. He wrote, we know the destination where humanity must eventually land and the natural shore for which the ship sets its course and anchors to arrive at peace and goodness and returns to a stable life. Filled with justice and happiness after long struggle and hardship and after wandering far and wide in various directions and on different courses. Again, a spatial metaphor for uh, economic development. As many of you know, uh, Said Qutb's most important uh, manifesto was called uh, signposts along the road, or sometimes translated as uh, milestones. Again, the kind of metaphor of racing along the road uh, on the path uh, to development. Signposts uh, defined Islamism in contrast uh, both to the, the materialism of the American and Soviet systems and harshly uh, condemned Nasser's uh, uh, Arab socialism. So these kinds of metaphors proliferated in Arabic writing and Arabic discourse um, as access to global travel expanded. As aerospace and automobility became the leading modern technologies, those technologies and other modes of travel came to serve for Americans and Arabs alike, uh, for uh, ideological orientations across a political spectrum as metaphors for modernization itself. But metaphors aren't politically neutral or innocent. They're strategically chosen to make a political argument, uh, albeit in a subtle way. In this case, describing modernization as a system akin to an airplane implicitly asserted an argument about the need for elite and technocratic authority. It promoted a structural and hierarchical understanding of society. So like a pilot, this metaphor suggested, society needed a skilled leader who understood how the parts functioned in relation to the whole. Post-war modernizers from US Cold Warriors like Rostow to Nasser and even Islamists like Qutb wrote about the need for a modernizing elite. In Qutb's uh, case, a vanguard, right? An elite leadership that could advance the modernization process among common people, including uh, peasants, including women, including workers, uh, and others. This sort of language, uh, which optimistically described modernization as moving society uh, rapidly forward, corresponded to the high hopes of the post-war era. By the late 1960s, however, uh, such optimism had faded uh, or even collapsed, not just in the Arab world, but in the United States as, as well. Military disasters like the Vietnam War, uh, like the 1967 Arab-Israeli War, uh, alongside economic problems, compromised the authority of post-war elites who had staked that authority on the promise of modernization and development. This loss of, of confidence in elite leadership and the way that post-war elites had made the case for their own authority, that language of speed, sheds new light on how to understand the late 1960s and early 1970s phenomenon of airline hijackings, which occurred not just in the Middle East, but also in the United States. Both in the US uh, and in the Middle East, this uh, was a phenomenon that uh, blossomed in the late 60s and early 70s. America witnessed dozens of hijackings during the late 60s and early 1970s, in the Arab world, hijackings were led by stateless uh, Palestinian fara'in, right, uh, who described their actions as revolutionary operations carried out not only against Israel, not only against the United States, but also against those they regarded as discredited Arab leaders. Those leaders included Nasser, right, who had promised to lead Egypt into economic takeoff, but also uh, Jordan's King Hussein, who promoted a non-revolutionary Hashemite modernity and who was himself literally a pilot. Right? So what I'm arguing is that conflicts over modernization weren't just over what characteristics made society modern or whether to follow secular or Islamist, revolutionary or evolutionary paths to modernity. There were conflicts over authority at a time when revolutions had undermined existing forms of authority. 
They were political struggles to decide who should be in charge of post-colonial Arab societies. By the 1970s, uh, the conversation about development and modernization in the Arab world and elsewhere uh, had changed dramatically from previous decades. It wasn't simply a case of Islamists filling the vacuum left by the defeat of Nasser and secular Arab nationalists. Few spoke any longer of modernity uh, in terms of competing systems, um, and both secular and Islamist intellectuals rediscovered the importance of tradition. Uh, rather than trying to metaphorically distance themselves from backwardness as modernization had previously been described. Some scholars today interpret the post-1967 era as witnessing a second nahta, right, or cultural awakening in Arab thought, comparing it to the flourishing of uh, Arabic letters uh, at the end of the 19th century. But the decline of post-war modernization was also a, a world historical phenomenon that affected not just the Arab world, but the US and many other societies. So this is a way of writing the Arab region, the Arab world into world history uh, on the basis of these uh, shared or common uh, world historical themes. Okay. So I'm gonna say uh, just a few words about uh, US policy toward revolutionary Iraq. Uh, and this is really a, a, obviously an important uh, a topic given um, contemporary, uh, giving contemporary issues. Since the U.S. occupied, uh, invaded and occupied Iraq uh, in 2003, we've become uh, accustomed to thinking about Iraqi politics in ethno-sectarian terms, right, based on uh, conflict among uh, Sunni, Shia, and Kurds. Um, in fact, U.S. officials uh, not only based uh, their policy in Iraq on this assumption, those policies have helped to reorient Iraqi politics around ethno-sectarian conflict in a way that made it a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. This ethno-sectarian understanding of, of Iraqi politics is often um, linked to descriptions of Iraq and other Arab states as artificial uh, creations of a colonial past um, and is incapable of being held together except by authoritarian rule. My research on the 50s and 60s, uh, however, points to a different interpretation of Iraqi politics, provides some new and uh, different context for understanding contemporary conflict. Um, Iraqi politics during this earlier period was, was based on conflict between secular modernizing ideologies and perhaps more importantly, rival interpretations of Iraqi nationalism. Right? So US intervention in Iraq also dates back to the late 1950s. American plans for regime change in Iraq uh, are half a century old or, or more. Okay? Long before, so long before the wars uh, against Saddam in 1991 and 2003. Um, I argue in the book that American Cold War interventions in Iraq undermined uh, possibilities for secular pluralism. In July 1958, Iraqi military officers overthrew the British-aligned monarchy in Baghdad. The uh, former government had joined the Baghdad Pact, British and American-sponsored Cold War Regional Defense Organization, um, and consented to the stationing of American uh, military advisors on Iraqi soil. The new government uh, was led by, uh, mentioned him before, Brigadier Abdel Karim Qasim, who's in the upper left, uh, and created a republic with a neutralist, uh, foreign policy in the Cold War, neither uh, part of the American or the Soviet bloc, um, and, but accepted economic aid from the Soviet Union. Qasim's own free officers and the country as a whole were divided, however, over Iraq's relationship to pan-Arab nationalism and its leader, the Egyptian President Abdel Nasser. Some pan-Arab nationalists, including members of the Ba'ath Party, believe that as an Arab country, Iraq should join the United Arab Republic, the UAR, the political union between Egypt and Syria led by Nasser. Parties on the left, including Iraq's influential Communist Party, opposed joining the UAR and promoted Iraqi state patriotism in which a socialist government would guarantee the rights of all citizens, regardless of religion or ethnicity, in an independent Iraq. Iraq then is now is a diverse society, 
uh, but its politics were divided between proponents of two secular ideologies, Arab nationalism, and ideologies of the left, including communism, and between pan-Arab and nation-state interpretations of nationalism, between Kalmia and Wataniya. As a strategy for maintaining support on the political left, Qasim appointed his cousin in the center uh, at the top, uh, a colonel named Fadl Abbas al-Mahdawi, as the head of a, a military court charged with putting members of the former regime uh, on trial. Although he wasn't a communist himself, Mahdawi was close to Iraq's Communist Party. He advocated closer uh, economic ties to the Soviet Union, which provided low interest loans and expert advice uh, to Iraq, setting up industrial enterprises and, and reforming agriculture. Madawi supported Qasim in confrontations with the Western-owned Iraq Petroleum Company, um, a stance that put him at odds with the U.S. Uh, the U.S. policy for modernization in Iraq was supporting Iraq's development through Western oil investments. More importantly, Madawi and his communist allies promoted a socialist vision based on state patriotism, as opposed to pan-Arab nationalism, a state patriotism in which Arabs, Kurds, Yazidis, Jews, Turkmen, and other groups would enjoy equality within an independent Iraq. Indeed, Iraq's Communist Party had many Kurds and other non-Arabs in its ranks, although party affiliations cut across ethnic lines and religious identities. Not surprisingly, Mahdawi's pro-communist activities attracted the attention of the U.S., of the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad and American officials in Washington. They helped to convince Dwight Eisenhower's administration that Qasim had become over overly dependent on the Soviets and on domestic communists. Following a clash between communists and nationalists in the city of Mosul, Eisenhower authorized the formation of a committee that for the first time drew up American plans for overthrowing the government in Iraq. This was in 1959. After an assassination attempt against Qasim by Ba'athist gunmen who included the future dictator, Saddam Hussein, Madawi uh, reconvened his people's court to try the assailants in absentia. Through these trials, he sought to convince ordinary Iraqis uh, that pan-Arab nationalists were uh, agents of Nasser and the Western powers, and that Iraq's future uh, could be secured only as an independent socialist state. His pan-Arab rivals countered that the Iraqi left wanted to bring Iraq under the control of the Soviet Union and represented a betrayal of Iraq's Arab character. In the context of the Cold War and concern for Iraq's oil resources, the U.S. took sides uh, in this dispute over how to define Iraqi nationalism uh, against the communists and on the side of pan-Arabists. Available evidence suggests that in early 1960, in the spring of 1960, the CIA attempted to pass Madawi a poisoned handkerchief. My point is that little more than half a century ago, Iraq's politics, the politics of development and modernization in Iraq, were dominated by conflicts over secular development between pan-Arab and leftist ideologies. Both Madawi and U.S. Officialed, uh, officials promoted Iraq's economic progress and sovereignty, but they defined these terms in antithetical ways or in incompatible ways. It was the communists and their allies like Madawi who took uh, the lead in arguing for a pluralist Iraq. To challenge Nasser's regional influence, Madawi published speeches, poems, pictures, and articles in the transcript of his People's Court. This is a marvelous primary source from the late 50s, early 1960s Iraq, 22 volumes of the court transcripts that includes not only the transcripts themselves, but uh, leftist political uh, literature, culture, poetry uh, from Iraq during this period. So this is an important source for me as well. So in that transcript, Mahdawi compared Iraq to revolutionary governments outside of the Middle East, such as those of Patrice Lumumba uh, in the Congo and Fidel Castro in Cuba. This strategy was meant to place Iraq in a global revolutionary 
context and to undercut Nasser's influence uh, in Iraq. Madawi promoted his own travels to the Soviet Union, to Eastern Bloc states, and to the People's Republic of China. You can see uh, in the center at the bottom a picture of Madawi in the center uh, together with uh, Mao, Mao Zedong in, in Beijing. Okay. Madawi uh, hailed the technical and uh, technological achievements of the Soviet Union, including uh, cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin's space flights. Uh, and he also celebrated the communist-led international peace movement in which both Iraqi uh, Arabs and Kurds participated. In the lower left of this uh, slide, you can see a hand drawing, a line drawing, of Yuri Gagarin, the Soviet cosmonaut, with his face superimposed over a dove of peace. So this is sort of a celebration of the international communist-led peace movement um, and also a, a, a kind of uh, homage to uh, Gagarin and the technical achievements of the Soviet Union. In response to this campaign, the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad quietly drew up lists of Iraqi communists who had signed pro-peace petitions in Iraq's leftist press. And this is one of the, some of the evidence from the American archives that's in, the, in my new book, uh, looks at this process of American officers at the, the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad going through Iraq's leftist press and finding these lists of petitions of people who had signed uh, and transmitting those lists back to the United States, back to, to Washington and to U.S. intelligence uh, in the United States. American officials established ties to nationalist officers in the military, including members of the Ba'ath Party, and on February 8, 1963, Ba'athist officers overthrew Qasim uh, and the next day executed both him and Matthau. John Kennedy's administration supported the new regime because officials believed that the Ba'ath would cut Iraq's ties to the Soviets and pursue friendlier relations with the Iraq Petroleum Company. This was celebrated in the Kennedy administration as a great uh, achievement and success. The U.S. supported the Ba'athist government throughout 1963 as it carried out uh, a violent anti-communist purge in which thousands were jailed, tortured, and killed. Many suspected of leftist ties were rounded up using prepared lists, likely supplied by the U.S. Uh, although the, the Ba'ath lost uh, power in November of 1963 and wouldn't again control Iraq's government until the late 1960s, its seizure of power led to the collapse of the truce that Qasim had negotiated between Baghdad and Kurds in the Iraqi north. Recent evidence suggests the, that the U.S. provided the Ba'athist government with napalm, which it used against Kurds in that fighting. The anti-communist purge and anti-Kurdish uh, campaign established a precedent for political violence that had implications for Iraqi history. So as this research shows, misinterpreting conflict uh, in Iraq as the product of uh, age-old ethno-sectarian uh, conflict or enmity among Sunni, Shia, and Kurds uh, is ahistorical. Doing so ignores the secular nature of political conflicts in modern Iraq, which involved uh, rival ideologies for economic development and alternative definitions of Iraqi nationalism. It also erases the role of serial U.S. interventions uh, in Iraq, uh, which undermine the prospects for a pluralist society. Right? Okay, so um, what are the implications of this research for today? And here I'll, I'll conclude. Um, in spite of today's uh, focus on sectarianism, on religious conflict, the dominant discourse in the Middle East not so long ago revolved around economic development and modernization. This debate was characterized by ideological pluralism, and Islamists participated in it using concepts that they shared with communists, with Arab nationalists, and with American cold warriors. This perspective casts doubt on portrayals of today's conflicts as only the latest reenactment of ancient sectarian or religious conflicts. It forces us to think critically about the recent antecedents of today's crises um, as the afterlife uh, of the ideological, political, and economic struggles of the 20th century. So the, the um, 
the sort of implication is that if such conflicts aren't inevitable, but historically contingent, then they're susceptible to political compromises, to political settlement. Finally, and then maybe most importantly, we should rethink uh, the, about the ways we uh, write and talk about relations between the US and the Arab world. Today's US-Arab uh, relations are characterized by a, a tremendous disparity in power, but now, as in the post-war period, uh, Americans cannot impose uh, any particular vision of the future on Arab societies. Instead of proceeding from an assumption uh, of fundamental cultural difference, you know, let alone a, a clash of civilizations, we should recognize that different peoples participate in the same global trends in ways that are shaped by their own historical experiences and political concerns. Rather than, than start from a premise of cultural difference and conflict, we should acknowledge a shared humanity. And there I'll conclude. Thanks for listening, and I look forward to your comments and questions.